Welcome back, everyone, to the sixth and final part of our reaction series to Catherine the Great on Extra History. I hope you guys have been enjoying this as much as I have. If you have not seen the first five parts, there's a link in the description that will take you all the way back to part one. Also, to let you know, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, my first episode from my trip to Gettysburg will be live. It's the story of the Iron Brigade, not only their history before the Battle of Gettysburg, but mostly centered around what happened during the Battle of Gettysburg. Part two of that Gettysburg series will be the story of three uh, young people of Gettysburg and their tragic fate, the story of Jack Skelly, Jenny Wade, and Wesley Culp. And that'll be coming next week sometime. So be watching for that. If you are not already subscribed, please check and make sure to see whether you're subscribed. Uh, a friend of mine whose t-shirt I'm wearing today, JD from the History Underground, um, has been having a lot of issues lately with people who were subscribed noticing they are no longer subscribed. So just want to make sure that you check that just to see if that's happening for you. If it does happen, if you were previously subscribed and you find you're not anymore, let me know in the comment section below. I'm just curious to see if that's happening for us like it is for JD. Let's go ahead and dive into part six. Once the terror of Eastern Europe, Poland had long been in decline. Catherine aimed to make that decline permanent. When Catherine first made war on the Ottomans, the biggest losses ended up being suffered by the Poles rather than the Ottoman Empire. For years, Catherine had a puppet, a former lover on the throne of Poland, but keeping him there, and keeping him doing the bidding of Russia, was becoming more and more difficult. And you know, whenever you say former lover, there's always that risk of, you know, what, you know, there, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, that's true for a lover scorned too. And, um, you know, so you got to be careful. It, it's a dangerous thing to have somebody who's a former anything, somebody that you're trying to rely on. Vast amounts of troops and treasure were required to keep Poland passive, and as you might remember, the first Russo-Ottoman conflict was, at least officially, caused by Russian troops chasing Polish rebels over the border into Ottoman territory. But Poland was at the center of everything, literally. The three great powers in Eastern Europe at the time were Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and in the middle of all of them sat Poland. Question for my European friends, does Prussia really kind of qualify as Eastern Europe. I've always kind of thought of that as being kind of Central Europe. Um, I guess I always kind of thought of Eastern Europe as Russia, Poland, um, the Balkans, but you know, I guess, I don't know. How do, you, how do you determine what's Eastern Europe? So Poland became the solution for a very thorny problem that faced the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. You see, Frederick had agreed to a secret alliance with Catherine, but the terms of it were very specific. If either of them fought with one of the other powers, all the other had to do was provide some financial support. But if either was attacked and ended up fighting two powers, well, the other one had to go all in joining their side. Now, Frederick really didn't like the idea of actually militarily supporting Russia. He wanted them on his side and all, but the Seven Years' War had really done a number on his forces and his mm. treasury. And in the Ottoman conflict, Russia was being a true pain and stomping the Turks far more than anybody really thought they would, which of course worried Austria, who needed the Ottomans as a counterbalance to Russia. Naturally, this meant that the Austrians were about to join the war on the Ottoman side, which would mean that Frederick would have to do the very boring and unfun act of honoring his treaty. See the echoes of what would happen in 1914 with the Great War, with World War I? Um, People getting into a war which triggers a set of alliances which kind of pull other people into a war they otherwise might not have been involved in. And some of the same exact parties uh, to that future conflict here, Prussia, Germany, uh, Austria, the Ottomans, Russia, same with the, some of the same people. But Frederick was a crafty fellow. He pondered the problem and did what he seems to have usually done and asked himself, how can I kill a whole bunch of birds with one stone? Because he really wanted a couple of things. First, he didn't want to have to send troops to fight some Russian war. Second, he wanted the Ottomans to owe him, in case he ever needed to use them against the Austrians or the Russians. And then there was this thorny issue of that big gap in his territory, mm. making it much harder to defend. So and again, 
that big gap in territory is going to come back to haunt uh, Europe when it comes to World War II because uh, in the aftermath of World War I you have that happen because um, they give Poland that access to the sea uh, which in an otherwise landlocked country because they don't have any of this at that point and that cuts off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. So we say it all the time, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself but it absolutely does rhyme. So he proposed a solution. Rather than Russia continuing to kick the Turks around and taking large portions of their territory, what if they took a big piece of Poland instead? And then, to maintain the balance of power, Austria could go in and take the most populous parts of Poland, and him, well, he would just take this wee bitty bit over there, a bit that happened to be the most strategically important for him, and provided him more ports on the Baltic. So this is the brilliance of diplomacy, when you are able to convince other people that they got the better end of the deal, or that they really benefited, but you got exactly what you wanted. Uh, so that's what's happening here is Prussia really wants this piece of land here. Uh, and if they can just make Austria and Russia feel like they really made out well while they get the piece that they really want, well, hey, you know, if, if Poland has to suffer, whatever, you know. So his solution was proposed and basically everybody was like, eh, sure, that works. And so, with plenty of urging from the surrounding Russian soldiers, they got Catherine's puppet in Poland to call the Polish version of a parliament to ratify the agreement. Of course, not enough members showed up to actually ratify the thing, but that wouldn't be a problem. The first thing those who did show up decided to do was change the rules. And thus, huge segments of Poland became Russian, Austrian, and Prussian overnight. From and Poland, they're thinking, okay, if we just pacify them, if we just give them what they ask for, what could go wrong? You know, everybody will be good, we'll be happy, we lose some land, sure, but at least we don't get gobbled up completely, right? Right? From then on, anytime Poland did anything Russia didn't like, Russia would just send the troops in. Then Prussia would suggest that they all just take another bite out of Poland, until finally, near the end of Catherine's rule, everyone just agreed to do away with the nuisance that was the ever-in-revolt state of Poland. But as Catherine's life came to its close, and the last chapter in the reign of Catherine the Great was being penned, all thoughts were on one thing, the succession. Mm. And here, perhaps, for all of Catherine's triumphs, was her greatest failing. And remember, there's a lot of questions about whether or not her son really was the product of her relationship with her husband, which is going to be an issue. The place where her own weaknesses and insecurities show through. The tragedy of her reign was that she left behind no one to carry on her legacy. After her, Russia would never again have a truly great emperor. Her son would grow up to be like the husband Catherine had despised. When he was born, little Paul had been whisked away by the then Empress Elizabeth. For eight years, Elizabeth had had maids and servants raise the boy, and when he was at last returned to Catherine, there was a distance between them that could never be bridged. The young man expected the warmth and attention that he'd never received during mm. those years apart from his mother. And while Catherine tried, Paul would always be jealous of the men in Catherine's life, as she seemed to focus more of her energy on them than on him. And this was compounded by Catherine's own paranoia. She saw her son not as an assistant and an heir, but a as a potential rival, yep. as the one person who might have a more legitimate claim to the throne than she. Yeah, because remember, her whole claim to the throne is that she overthrew her husband. And so a lot of people probably argued very strongly and probably correctly that once her husband was no longer on the throne, that it shouldn't pass to her, but to her son. You know, this happened, as I mentioned earlier, in England when Isabella overthrows her husband, Edward II. She does so in the name of her son, Edward III, who then becomes the king. But she's the one running the show, her and her husband, Roger Mor or her lover, Roger Mortimer. But it was her son who was the heir at that point. You know, Paul's really the heir to the throne here, assuming he really is her husband's son. So she kept him away from the halls of government, away from any responsibility, from being an actor in the affairs of state. And slowly, he took to idolizing the father who might not have been mm. his father. He would play with soldiers and march his servants around like Peter had. 
Catherine and her closest advisors eventually decided this had to stop, and so they sought a wife for him, hoping that being married might make him grow up. So let's talk about this for a second, this whole idolizing his father thing. So what's happening here is you've got a mother who's alive and there, but isn't there, right? So she's kind of kept her son at a distance. They've never had a close relationship. So rather than trying to continue to live up to being like his mother, who he just has been rejected by, now he's got the memory of his dead father, who he's going to uh, try to idolize. And because his father's dead, a lot of times what happens is when people are gone, they get mythologized. They We think of them for all their best qualities and not their worst. And so he starts to idolize his father. We do this with, with military figures all the time. People like uh, Erwin Rommel or Stonewall Jackson, when they die before the end of the war, it's easier to say, wow, boy, they were just so good. And they you know, had all these great qualities because we never saw them ultimately lose and we didn't see some of their failings. And uh, so that's what he's doing here. He's idolizing his father for all the qualities that he thinks uh, he's kind of projecting and, and not necessarily for the weak, ineffective ruler that he was. But his first marriage ended in deep tragedy. His wife died in the birth of their oh. first son and their son died with her. And as he was going through her papers, Paul discovered that she'd been carrying on an affair with his closest friend. Oh. He was laid low with grief. Just like his mother, right? His mother who has time for all these other men, but not for me. And now his wife did the same thing to him. This guy has been rejected and abandoned by the women in his life. And boy, that had to have affected him. But he was convinced to marry again for the sake of the state. His new wife was perfect for him. She supported him, eased his anxiety. Together they toured Europe, where for the first time he was fated and treated like a ruling mm. member of some great state. And in these few months, you can see this possibility, this glimmer of hope in the letters the rulers of Europe wrote to one another upon meeting this young man, that he might be something more than his father. Was he perfect? Well, no, but they all remark on him being capable, intelligent, and, when his wife was at his side, able to let go of the anxiety and the paranoia that plagued him. But when he returned from Europe and asked to be part of the cabinet, Catherine again dismissed him, telling him that his trip had made him put on airs. So he gets built up, built up, built up by all these other people. He comes home looking for that validation from mom and boom, door shut in his face again. Mm. He asked to fight in the army and she said no. On every front, she still kept him from having any of the responsibility of state. And no thought whatsoever to what happens after she's gone. No thought to the long-term stability of, of the kingdom of the empire. Uh, boy, this, this is a major failing on Catherine's part. So he sank back down into his anxiety and his paranoia. And as he grew older, rumors abounded that Catherine was going to disinherit him for one of his own sons. Now, whether she actually did or not is one of those historical questions that we'll never really have an answer. Some say that she left instructions in her will to pass the empire to her grandson, but that Paul had had that will destroyed before anyone could discover it. Others say that she died before she made up her mind on the issue. But Catherine, forgetting some of the pains of her own childhood, let her insecurities prevent her from giving her son the training or the care that he needed to rule. In the end, his paranoia became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and yep. he would be assassinated not long into his reign. And the last days for Catherine saw other steps backward as well. The Pugachev Rebellion had convinced her to step back from granting rights to the serfs, something that she had considered doing in her younger days. And now the French Revolution made her doubt all of the Enlightenment mm. ideas that she had so loved, and that in some ways had helped her carry her country so far. Because in France is where a lot of the Enlightenment is really flourished, and now they see what happens when they go extreme and, and the terrors happening, and, and tens of thousands of people are being killed uh, just because they say the wrong thing or they believe the wrong thing or just because somebody else doesn't like them and wants them taken care of. And yeah, I can see how, boy, at the end of her life, just things are falling apart. She banned private printing presses Ooh. and made all works be approved by a censorship office. She even stopped the circulation of books by some of the very men she had corresponded with in her youth. Paranoia at work. so, in the end, on the 17th of November, 1796, Catherine died of a stroke leaving behind her a Russia that was larger, stronger, and more developed than ever before. 
She had championed health, maternal rights, and education. She had expanded the country on every border, from Poland to Georgia to Alaska. She patronized the arts, built great palaces and wonders like the Hermitage. Mm. Under her, the army had gone from a second-rate power scoffed at in the halls of Europe to something feared the world round. She issued the first Russian banknote and brought the Enlightenment to Russia. And though she began to step back from that Enlightenment and left Russia with a dynasty incapable of completing her legacy, it cannot be said that she was anything but the Great. And if you think about it, 1796 she dies. It seems like there's a huge gap between Catherine the Great's time and the Russian Revolution, but we're talking about, what, 120 years? I mean, that's it. 120 years to when her descendant, Nicholas II, is going to be overthrown. Um, so it's really not that long. I mean, the distance between Catherine the Great's reign and the end of Nicholas II's reign, uh, when the re revolution happens, it is the same distance between today and the Wright brothers. Today and Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I mean, that's really not that long when you think about it that way. Um, so, uh, interesting stuff. Really enjoyed that series. Hope you did as well. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll put up a vote today over on Patreon about what you'd like to see next. I've got a few ideas on that, but tomorrow we'll be Gettysburg, and then we'll go from there. Thanks for watching.